and welcome back while we would have loved to have been there in person hey what else can we do but welcome you virtually I'm delighted to have team work arts in association with asia society texas center and imprint welcome you to this session of jlf houston's virtual festival our session today is how innovation works and why it flourishes in freedom matt ridley in conversation with shruti rajgopalan how innovation works and why it flourishes in freedom by mike pridley is a fascinating analysis of innovations across time and history it argues that innovation is an incremental bottom up and unpredictable process resulting from human exchange the fifth viscount ridley is a hereditary peer who has been a member of the british parliament and is also the author of the evolution of everything how new ideas emerge and the rational optimist how prosperity evolves in conversation with scholar economist and columnist shruti rajagopalan he discusses the importance of collective and collaborative innovation and its significance in the shaping of the 21st century matt ridley's books have sold over a million copies and has been translated into 31 languages and has won several awards book include the red queen genome Uh, the rational optimist and the evolution of everything his book how innovation works was published in 2020 he joined the house of lords in february 2013 and he served in the science and technology select committee and the artificial intelligence select committee he was founding chairman of the international center for life in newcastle he was also a fellow of the royal society of literature and of the academy of medical sciences Shruti Rajagopalan is the senior research fellow of the Indian Political Economy program at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and a fellow at the NYU School of Law. Dr. Rajagopalan writes the impartial spectator column in Mint and is the host of the Ideas of India podcast. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A so please do feel free to send in your questions with which Shruti will pose of Matt at the end of the session. As you know all our sessions are available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel after they broadcast on this particular uh, page do also follow our pages JLF Lit Fest on Twitter Instagram and Facebook uh, stay tuned uh, to the jlflitfest.org/houston for the full schedule and information about our speakers and do remember after Houston we move on to New York and thereafter to JLF Toronto in these extremely difficult times we've really struggled to bring you JLF Houston and all our other festivals across the world without charging a registration free we do believe that knowledge and information is really in many ways uh, the cornerstone of everything that we do and the need of the hour to push back on hatred and misinformation please do donate as generously as you can to ensure a continued free flow of knowledge which is vital not just to resolve the covid crisis to share how best it works in different countries but also as i said to push back on misinformation please donate to us on our website jlfletfest.org/houston ladies and gentlemen how innovation works and why it flourishes in freedom Shruti Rajagopalan over to you. Thank you Sanjoy uh, for such a warm welcome and thanks to everyone uh, at JLF and hello to everyone in Houston uh, where we can't be present physically but thanks to technology and innovation as Matt would agree uh, we're there uh, virtually to share our ideas. Uh, welcome Matt this is it's such a joy to speak with you I've, as you know I've always been a big fan of your books and I and I want to get to it uh, right away uh so you've sort of in one sense in how innovation works you've removed the romance and magic and mysticism from innovation right uh, you've demolished this great man thesis uh, you've completely separated you know uh, this uh, obsession with inventors as geniuses with these eureka moments and instead you systematically show in case after case that the best thing for innovation is actually trial and error 
right? Perspiration, not inspiration. So uh, <laughs> you're laughing, but but that's sort of, you know, the one part of the book. On the other hand, it's not all bad news, right? You bring back the magic and romance somewhere completely different, and I think somewhere much more important. And this is your case for a free society, right? Where, uh, you know, in a world where there's permissionless exchange and permissionless innovation, that has the power to, you know, unleash the creative and entrepreneurial juices of very ordinary people who become innovators. They don't need to be geniuses, right? As long as they function in a broader ecosystem that makes trial and error possible. So is this a good summation of the sort of like the good news and the bad news uh, in the book? Shruti, that's an absolutely brilliant summary of, of my argument. Um, but I, I think I would argue that, that both sides of that equation are actually good. So, um, yes, you're right that I do try and take the theory of the heroic inventor down a peg. Uh, I try and uh, draw back the curtain and show that whenever somebody became incredibly famous for inventing something, uh, he or she was building on the achievements of many other people, was collaborating with other people, and wasn't really showing some special juice inside their bodies that other people didn't have. Call it genius, call it creativity, whatever you want to call it. It was just hard work, common sense, open-mindedness, uh, and pre being prepared to fail and try again, things like that. So in that sense, I want to democratize the pr the. the, the story of innovation. I'm, I want to make it clear that anyone can do it. And lots of ordinary people do do it. Um, uh, but at the same time, the way I tell the stories in the book is by telling stories about people. Um, I do very much single out individuals and tell their tales uh, in a way to sort of get this point across. So I hope it's just as entertaining uh, as, as uh, even though I'm, I'm also saying that they don't deserve quite the same credit. Probably the, the perfect example of the point you just made is that a very grand man called Samuel Langley got a very big grant from the US government to build an airplane. And he was very well connected and he had a lot of money and he did the whole thing in secret because he knew that he was cleverer than everybody else. Uh, and it was a total flop and the airplane crashed into, into the Potomac River within 20 yards. Ten days later, on an island off North Carolina, two humble bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, called Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, achieved uh, the powered flight with no connections, no money, no government support, anything. And they did it by collaborating, connecting, networking, picking the brains of other people, doing a ton of experiments with gliders and kites and things like that. So... Um, I think there's just as much romance in a, in a um, more democratic version of innovation than the great man theory. Absolutely. And in one sense, there, there are more people to credit, right? Uh, so, so where we take away the romance from the genius invest, inventor, now you have a lot more people that one needs to thank. It's almost like a reading of eye pencil or something like that, right? Like yes. who invented the light bulb or who invented, uh, you know, the airplane? And the answer to that suddenly is not so simple. And there is something a little bit special about that too, which is the magic of social cooperation, right? So, so yes, exactly. The, the extent of the of the order, right, of the exchange and the spontaneous order that needs to take place both across the world and across time uh, to make this possible at the right moment that that does have something a little bit special, and maybe that's the magic that that you know that's brought to the table through innovation. Yes, and, and there's, there's one feature of it that I, I'm still puzzling over. I can't quite get my head around how it works. And that is that innovation is amazingly obvious and predictable when you look backwards. So as you say, 21 different people came up with the idea of the light bulb around the same time. There was Swan here in England and Edison in America and Lodigan in Russia and so on. Um, and that looks weird. But it's true of almost every device you can think of, and many scientific discoveries too, that you get this simultaneous invention. You get more than one person having the same idea at the same time. Um, uh, uh, and yet, looking forwards, we can't tell when an innovation is going to happen. Um, so to, to make that very clear, think about the search engine. 
Um, I think the search engine is probably the most useful innovation of my lifetime. I use it pretty well every day. I can't remember what life was like without it. How on earth did we ever find anything out without search engines? Um, uh, but I'm old enough to remember that, that, <laughs> that there was a, a time before search engines. And once the internet became uh, functional and widespread, it was inevitable and obvious that people would invent search engines. You don't need Larry Page to bump into Sergey Brin at Stanford University to invent Google uh, to have search engines. There were lots of other rival things, Yahoo and others around already at that time. And one of them would have scooped the pool in the way that Google scooped the pool. Um, so th in that sense, the invention of the search engine was wholly obvious and inevitable. But can you find people in the 1980s predicting it? No, you can't. Every now and then you can find a slightly prescient remark, but it's, it's pretty vague. And uh, certainly no one spotting that this is going to be the way to make money out of the internet, which it turned out to be. Um, uh, and so, you know, what's going on here? Why, why is it so um, asymmetric that the, 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 the knowledge that go, comes together to produce an innovation um, just can't be foreseen and yet in, in retrospect, it looks fantastically obvious. That's something that fascinates me uh, about innovation. And maybe you've got some ideas about how I can solve that conundrum. I, I doubt I'm going to come up with anything better than you. But, you know, there's one thing you do say in the book, and I'm not, you know, quoting this perfectly from memory. You basically say no one can tell you exactly when and how progress will happen. Right. Uh, no one can predict that if someone does and their prediction turns out to be right, they probably just got lucky. Right. It cannot be guessed. It cannot be orchestrated. It cannot be manipulated. But we do know the circumstances, the broad set of circumstances in which it happens. Right. Yep. And one uh, possible um, answer that I have to the question you just posed me is maybe uh, this has its roots somewhere in Paul Romer's endogenous growth theory, which yes. you talk about a little bit in the book, which is this idea that there are these, you know, knowledge is both endogenous to go growth and emerges like in, in greater amounts, there's an increasing rate of return of knowledge produced from that growth, right? Which is why some of this happens in uh, big city environments and things like that. And I think uh, the, the endogeneity of growth and knowledge, you know, that tight link may have something to do with why these things suddenly prop up in clusters, right? There are a lot yes. of people who are kind of in a similar environment who may spot similar opportunities or who are having interesting similar conversations at a particular point in time. And it could have been Newcastle, you know, two, 300 years ago. Yeah. And, and today it's Silicon Valley and tomorrow it would be somewhere in China, right? Uh, but it's happening at the same time. And I think that may have something to do with why it is so hard to predict, why it's so easy to see in hindsight and also why it possibly pops up in clusters. Yes, I, th I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. And um, uh, one of the features of innovation that I find fascinating is that it isn't universally spread around the world at any one time. There are these extraordinary bushfires of, of innovation that, that happen in you know, the Ganges Valley a long time ago, and then um, uh, um, the, the Greek city-states, and then in uh, Arabia, and then in China, and then in uh, the low countries and then in England and then in California and now in China and where next um, of course where are we going to have it next at the end of the book I actually say that I don't quite say my money's on India but I yeah. do say that it's the, the next place is there to be grasped uh, I don't think the Chinese regime will be able to hang on to an innovation uh, ecosystem for very long because whereas the reason it's been in China recently is because there was a certain amount of economic freedom in China. Um, not much political freedom, but a certain amount of economic freedom. If you wanted to start a business, it was very easy. Um, uh, and that's changing. Uh, and yeah. so I think it's, you know, there's a vacancy. Uh, I don't think Europe is very good at innovation. Uh, I don't think America's as good as it was. Uh, somebody needs to uh, step forward and say, right, we're going to we're going to be the um, you know the Renaissance Italy of the next uh, few decades, 
And where better than India, an English-speaking country with a fantastic education system and a growing economy and a tradition of democracy and openness, um, I hope, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, while we're on that topic, uh, one of the innovations I write about in the book, and it's not a physical innovation, it's a mental innovation, is the, the, the concept of zero as a number. Um, and with it, the decimal system of counting, which is an incredibly important feature. And of course, Europe got it from Italy and the Italians got it through Fibonacci from North Africa. And the North Africans got it from Arabia, from Al Khwarizmi. And it turns out the, the uh, Arabians got it from India. Yeah. Uh, so the trail of that really important innovation goes back to India um, and uh, uh, transformed the world dramatically. You know, I was, I meant to ask you a little bit later about India. I'm glad you brought it up. Sorry, and and you mentioned before about the kinds of spontaneous orders that you have witnessed, you know, in India, how, you know, it's fundamentally a democratic country, it's English speaking, so on. Now, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about India uh, relative to you, and I'll tell you why. Because within the system that you describe, Permissionless exchange and permissionless innovation, you know, that's the ability to buy, sell, exchange, to set up a new business, to come up with a new idea without a government or a bureaucrat or a regulator telling you if this is okay or not okay. Uh, that seems to be key to the innovation process, right? I mean, if those, those are not there perfectly, if there are bad regulators, it certainly slows innovation down uh, the way you described in the European Union. The problem is in India, the whole license permit Raj system, uh, it didn't go away entirely, right? Some of it went away in, in early 90s when India partially liberalized, but it's completely alive and well. The second part with where I'm a little less optimistic about India relative to you is um, the lack of federalism. Right, you have a big discussion in the book about how yes. very large centralized structures are bound to fail, right? And governments and very large companies are a big example of that. And startups, small cities, you know, city states, those which are just smaller and maybe competing with one another are much more likely to come up with good ideas because there is a competition among these, these units. And for these two reasons, I'm a little bit nervous. And I think the lesson for India is both, you know, becoming more federal and, and eliminating this kind of license permit, Raj. Uh, what do you think? Um, those yeah, I, I think you're dead right about both of those things. I, I don't know India very well, but I think the license Raj is, is clearly a, a problem. And um, uh, you could probably blame the Brits for it in some sense, but maybe that's long enough ago, so, so that it's not all our fault. Um, uh, uh, and it's certainly not my fault. Um, and, uh, but in terms of the federal point, I think this is a really important and underappreciated thing. Because we often say, look, big free trade area is ideal for innovation. You know, the more you can have free trade, then off you go. It's fine. But it's also very important that you allow experimentation, that you allow different rules in different places. That was the, the reason Europe had its great breakthroughs uh, in the, between 1500 and 1900 was because it was very hard to unify. You know, it's... It, you know, ask Hitler, Napoleon, Charles V and others, you can't turn it into an empire for very long. Um, it, it breaks up because of the way the mountain ranges and the peninsulas and the offshore islands are organized. It's actually a very hard continent to, to turn into one country. And that meant that innovators moved from one place to another. You know, the, 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 the pioneer of printing, Gutenberg, uh, moved from Mainz to uh, Strasbourg and so on. You know, there's lots of examples of this, of, of, of looking around for a congenial regime in which to work. Uh, you get competition between governance entities. And something similar, I think, happened in China in its golden age. The Song Dynasty of about a thousand years ago, tremendously inventive period, gunpowder, compasses, printed paper, sorry, printed money, um, printing generally, you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and that was that that dynasty was was very untypical of Chinese empires in that it was it was devolved it was democ it was uh, uh, um, localized that that on the whole merchants were in charge in their own cities and after a Mongol interregnum it's followed by the Ming Empire which takes completely the opposite approach of 
tremendous centralization that, that, that basically the mandarins uh, in the capital tell the merchants uh, what they can and can't do, whether they can trade, whether they can move, whether they, uh, how much they must keep in their storehouses and so on. And that kills uh, the Chinese economy pretty well stone dead in a, in a century or two. Um, and, you know, I could draw other lessons from other empires, the Ottoman Empire, very anti-innovative, very centralized. Um, and I'm afraid the European Union, because the way the European Union is organized, it's all about harmonization. It's all about saying the rules are going to be exactly the same everywhere. Um, and uh, that, in the end, makes it hard to innovate because it doesn't allow for, for local experimentation. The alternative way of organizing the European Union is to say, look, it's a free trade area, but there's mutual recognition. In other words, if the rules deciding whether a product is safe in France are different from the rules to decide whether the same product is safe in England, it doesn't matter as long as we recognize that if it's good enough for the French, it's good enough for us, so there's no tariffs and trade barriers between us. And I feel that's the, 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 the original sin of the European Union is failing to go down that path and instead going down the harmonization route. And that's why Europe has been unable to spawn much of significance in the, uh, in the way of digital giants to rival Amazon and Apple and Google and so on, uh, and indeed their Chinese equivalent, Alibaba and so on. Um, so uh, you're, you're dead right that India should be more federal. It is quite federal, but it should be more so because you know, America, of course, is the exception that proves the rule here. America looks like a, a great big empire, but it isn't. It's a, uh, or it has been until relatively recently, um, a, a very um, uh, localized and devolved situation with big differences between the states. I completely agree with you on, on the European Union. I mean, not only has it failed to encourage innovation, it's actually two steps worse, right? Even innovations that take place outside the European Union, they take about two or three or five years to recognize that the innovation even took place and allow it, you know, per their safety standards or per their very monolithic, you know, uniform set of standards that they impose on the entire union. I want to switch gears a little bit uh, to vaccines. You know, this is a, yes. a big, important chapter in your book. It comes right after energy, which seems to be a very nice way to also sort, you know, in the order of importance, what's happening in the world. And you, of course, wrote this before the pandemic. Uh, so it has nothing uh, about the COVID vaccine. But I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about that. So it's very clear from your book that your argument is this kind of, you know, centralized creationist uh, mindset towards innovation really doesn't work very well, mm -hmm. right? It needs to come bottom up. And that's exactly what we've seen during the pandemic, right? Different pharmaceutical companies, different labs across the world are collaborating. You know, the manufacturers are somewhere in India. The labs are in Oxford or they're, they're up here in Cambridge, right? So so you see that already happening. Having said that, there still seems to be a very important role for the state, right, in, in the scheme of things, right? Uh, which, you know, at one level is things like making sure there is FDA approval or, you know, European Union approval for whatever vaccine comes through, uh, but also creating an environment where these kinds of investments are possible. So what is your view on the vaccine that's come, that we've come up with, now we know there are at least two working vaccines uh, for the COVID pandemic. Do you think we got there really fast? We could have gotten there faster. Do you think it was inevitable? Uh, you know, what is going on with the COVID vaccine? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, and my starting point is to say the vaccines remind us of the importance of innovation, because frankly, we entered this pandemic with a disgracefully slow and old fashioned platform for developing vaccines. And I'm not just saying that with hindsight, people were saying that uh, before the pandemic, we were saying, look, we've got to do something about the fact that we haven't speeded up the way we develop vaccines and we haven't got a high success rate and the pharmaceutical industry is not interested because they're very hard to make money out of. Um, uh, and sure enough, the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust and a couple of governments, including the Indian government and the uh, Norwegian government got together some years ago and said, look, we need a coalition for ep epidemic preparedness innovation. 
as it's called. Uh, we need to, be, to, to develop vaccine platforms that are, are ready to go when a, when a pan pandemic starts. Uh, it's a great idea. It's the right way to go. It started too late. It started in 2017. It should have started. If it had started 10 years earlier, I think we'd be in a very diff different position. And I'm, I tell the story in the book of the development of the whooping cough vaccine in the 1930s by two rather amazing women uh, in the American Midwest in their spare time. Uh, and that took four years. Now, that would be good going today, yeah. nearly 100 years later. That's extraordinary. Think of other fields where there's been so little progress. So it's something of a disgrace, as I say, that we haven't been able to, to, to come up with better vaccine development platforms. I suspect this pandemic will solve that and sort that. And we will now uh, put more emphasis on this issue. Uh, uh, and hopefully we will learn, as you hinted at in your question, from the fact that we had to start a lot of horses in this race um, to find which one is the winner. Um, we didn't know until a few weeks ago whether uh, inactivated vaccines, attenuated vaccines, um, uh, um, uh, genetically modified vaccines, M messenger RNA vaccines, a new idea, um, would work. It turns out that the two winners so far, who seem to, to have got phase three results before anybody else in less than a year, which is fairly spectacular progress by previous standards, are the messenger RNA vaccines. Um, that's the Pfizer one and the Moderna one. They are both... Um, uh, BioNTech and, and Moderna, I should say. And they are both um, using this idea of simply putting the messenger RNA for one of the proteins um, uh, in a, uh, a capsule of some kind and injecting it into the body uh, for one of the virus proteins. And your body will then make the protein and have an immune reaction to it and set up a, uh, an immune response. Um, it's a very nice simplified version of the, the process of vaccination. Uh, and it, um, uh, ho you know, the, but, it, but we didn't know whether it would work or not. Uh, it's looking like it will. And I suspect that will transform vaccine production uh, from now on. Um, yes, obviously, you need government involvement in this because government is one of the biggest purchasers of healthcare. But notice that, you know, the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust have been crucial in this too, that philanthropic involvement can be very important. Um, and the Gates Foundation did something very smart with respect to vaccines recently in another case. Um, uh, pneumococcus is a disease that kills poor children in poorer parts of the world in large numbers. Uh, because it's a disease of the poor and it's not a huge disease, there's, it's just not worth a pharmaceutical industry developing a vaccine against it. Uh, there's no profit in it. So the Gates Foundation went to the pharmaceutical industry and said, look, we're going to dangle a prize in front of you. Um, if you can develop a, a vaccine to pneumococcus, we'll give you a, a lot of money. It's not going to be a lump sum. What it's going to be is an advanced market commitment. We'll buy these vaccines. We'll make sure that you can sell them for a high enough price to make it worth your while. And we'll make sure they're available at a low, low enough price so that people can actually use them. Uh, and that worked very well. Uh, it resulted in three effective vaccines in a relatively short space of time. So um, there, are, there are push and pull factors that need to be got right to transform a field like this. And it's important not to think that you can sort of just solve every problem with money. I mean, I, elsewhere in the book, I argue that, you know, there are certain uh, constraints that you won't be able to overcome. You can't we don't seem to be able to improve transport the way we, yes. we were doing throughout most of the 20th century. Um, but vaccination is an area where I think we, we, we had, can do better and should do better and have done better. And the other thing I love about vaccines as a story of innovation is that we were using them for hundreds of years before we understood how they worked. Um, I tell the story of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who brought them back to Britain from the from Constantinople, and also the slave Onesimus, who brought them to um, Boston from a Africa. Not them, but the idea of not vaccination as it then was, but inoculation. Inoculations. Um, and uh, um, so it goes back a long way, and it was a weird, foolish, dangerous idea. You know, you, you deliberately give an infection to someone in the hope that it'll stave off a future infection that might be worse. 
I mean, how much of a quack nonsense idea could that possibly be? Um, uh, so there was huge opposition, violent opposition to the pioneers of vaccines. Uh, and yet they have saved more lives than anything else. And the, the eradication of smallpox from the face of the planet is, I would say, up there as one of the greatest human achievements of all time. Absolutely. No, and there's a lovely story, I can share it with you, uh, on how the princesses of Mysore actually posed for an ad with, uh, you know, a smallpox inoculation, you know, the, with the patch on the hand where they actually get inoculated. Because wow. this was a time when there was a global human chain that was forming where, you know, each infected person could, could inoculate the next person and so on and so forth. This is not the world of cold storage and warehousing. And yes. to suggest that this is perfectly safe, the princesses actually got inoculated and they posed for paintings and things like that. Do you know what, what date message. would that have been? 18th um, century or? Uh, no, I think this was the 19th century. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's yes, really so I'll, I'll send you this, this lovely story. I think the BBC covered it recently. I want to shift gears a little bit because I have just a few more minutes to talk about a very interesting part of the book uh, where we, I mean, of course, the fundamental mechanism in the book is trial and error, right? So uh, assumed in trial and error is that the optimal error rate in, in an ecosystem that merits information is not zero. You need some error, right? <laughs> but on the yes. other hand, you also have a fantastic chapter on fakers, right? Uh, and how to detect fakes. Right. And this is, of course, the great story of, you know, Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes in, in our modern time. It's this astonishing story. Uh, and so my question to you is, it's very clear that the optimal amount of error is not zero. Is the optimal amount of faking zero uh, <laughs> in a world where you want innovation and progress? And, and that's only like a part facetious question. I, yes. I mean, the whole fake it till you make it, is, is that exactly. concept uh you know, still really important and there are going to be some bad apples like, you know, Elizabeth Holmes, but they're still part of the larger ecosystem and one shouldn't clamp down on them. Or do you have a slightly different view on outright fraud? Well, it's a really good question. And uh, I love the way you put it. Um, and yes, I think fake it till you make it is, is a really good way of starting on this uh, answer because uh, Steve Jobs was wont to do something which Thomas Edison also did, which was to stand up and announce a product that he hadn't yet um, perfected. Yes. Um, you know, in a year's time, we're going to produce a device that does this. And some of his executives were horrified, you know, but we, we don't know how to make it yet. Um, and uh, this was partly to frighten off his rivals. It was partly to boost the share price, it, but it was partly to challenge his own team to jolly well solve this problem. And in Steve Jobs' case, it was possible and it worked because Moore's law would come to his rescue. Yes. The, the inevitable, inexorable, incremental improvement in computing over time, you know, where you get twice as much computing for a given outlay of money every 18 months, um, was, was likely to bail Steve Jobs out. <laughs> um, and that's the, the mistake. Elizabeth Holmes made. Um, she essentially modeled herself on Steve Jobs and she hoped to be able to say, um, yeah, I don't yet know how to diagnose hundreds of diseases from a tiny drop of blood taken from your finger, uh, but we're well on the way to solving that problem. Well, it turned out that the smaller you make a, a transistor on a chip, uh, not only the uh, cheaper, but also the more reliable it is. That's extraordinary, but it's true. Um, it's not the case with a blood test. It's the opposite. Yes. The smaller the sample, the harder it is, harder it is to get it right. So, um, in, so that form of faking, yes, does clearly have a place. Um, what about examples of, uh, you know, genuine frauds, but honest ones who were trying to, 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 to solve a problem and thought they'd done it? Like, say, you know, the cold fusion story of, of yeah. uh, 20 years ago, you know, where it was thought that you could get immense amounts of energy uh, uh, very cheaply and easily out of matter um, and initially their experiments seemed to stand up to um, uh, scrutiny and uh, and then for a number of years thereafter there was a rear guard action of people saying yeah you know there's still something there you know maybe muons are involved or something um, 
I, I, I think that's fair enough. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to be allowed to fail um, uh, in this world. Steve, uh, not Steve Jobs, um, Jeff Bezos is very clear on this. He wants his colleagues swinging and missing, as he puts it. That's a baseball metaphor, which I don't fully understand, but I think I know what it means. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, so, yes, let's not throw, as we crack down on some appalling frauds, and I tell the story of the, the fake bomb detectors, which had nothing inside them, um, but took in a lot of people in the aftermath of the Iraq war and probably led to a lot of deaths. Um, while we rightly coruscate such people, we mustn't lose sight of the need for a little bit of um, dodgy practice yeah. just to sort of discover what's out there. <laughs> Absolutely. I, no, I better and, not be and, quoted you know, on that. This, and, and I, I think the, the Jeff Bezos and Elizabeth Holmes is a great uh, contrast because Jeff Bezos got so much flack in the late 1990s, early 2000s for failing on a much smaller scale. But the good thing was we knew he was failing because he was transparent, right? And there was a lot of experimentation and trial and error. Uh, the, the trouble on the other hand with Holmes was there was a lot of secrecy. Uh, you couldn't see the failures and that's why when you finally detect the failure, it's massive. So if culturally as a society, we're a little bit more forgiving of error and failure, then we might get more of it, but on a smaller scale versus, you know, otherwise. I think you're dead right. Transparency is, 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 is what, is what makes it acceptable. Yeah. And now we have to open up, uh, you know, to questions from the wonderful people who are attending the Houston Houston Festival. And uh, I already have the first question. Uh, Anna asks, how does one look at the platform of innovation and growth in the Indo-Pacific region, keeping in mind the astronomical growth and power of China, right? How does this present a point of friction between countries uh, in the region and sort of China's attempt to overwhelm and get a stronghold of the region? Well, um, I'm no geopolitical expert, um, but I think it's not difficult to read that uh, China increasingly wants to use its economic strength uh, in political terms uh, in the region. And it is uh, a huge issue for politicians in that region and also elsewhere in the world, in America and in, in Europe. Um, uh, f f in, until a few years ago, I would have been quite starry-eyed and optimistic about this, that look, the Chinese are innovating, they're integrating, they're trading. What's the problem? Uh, if they make stuff that we want to buy, good for them. If we make stuff they want to buy, good for us. Everybody's um, benefiting. Um, but it feels like that uh, relationship, which was between the rest of the world and China, which was going in a good direction, no longer is. Uh, and the degree of secrecy and top-down control and political uh, um, uh, direction of what's happening in China is a real threat to this this relationship between the rest of the world and China. Um, uh, I, I, you know, we mustn't get into the mindset where we say we have to confront China and then they feel threatened and they confront us back and suddenly we're in the 1930s again um, with China instead of Japan, if you like. Uh, yeah. but, but somewhere short of that, there is a sensible way for other countries to boost their own innovative economies through having greater freedom. If China really does crack down on its innovators and its entrepreneurs to the extent that the Xi regime appears to be doing, it, they won't produce the goods. They'll yeah. stop innovating. And that's a fantastic opportunity for other countries, you know, as I said, for India, but also for Indonesia and Australia and Japan and, and other places to say, right, well, we'll pick up the pieces. We'll, we'll invent the next um, uh, type of biotechnology or computing or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and then uh, China will have to get it from us. Um, yeah. And that would be, uh, that, that would make them a little more of a supplicant and a little less of a, uh, whatever the opposite, opposite of a supplicant is. <laughs> Two questions specific to China. You know, one, 
in the book you talk about you know the same thing that you mentioned that you know post the deng xiaoping reforms there's this bottom up bottom up innovation china is a lot more decentralized you know in fact when you go there then it seems on the outside of course there is this top down centralist you know communist party regime do you think that there is you know some kind of scale issue here in the beginning you know as long as there is you know decentralized local competition things are fine but as the emergent order becomes larger and larger and it scales up then the top level political institutions and political freedom just start becoming really important or do you think china is just you know got caught up in this particular moment when it's finally come to its reckoning of you know increasing transparency and reducing political constraints i think the history of china shows that that it it succumbs to an over centralized regime far too often that this happened under mao it happened under the ming it happened under various previous it happened under the mongols you know that that, that there's something about the geography uh, the economic and physical geography of china that lends itself to to centralized control um but i don't think it's inevitable i think i mentioned the song dynasty uh, the tang dynasty likewise you know th th this is an area uh, a part of the world that that is capable of uh, of of being a, a much more um open and decentralized society as well so i don't i don't see it as a, as a as a consequence of growth in size where i do think growth in size leads to uh, less innovative thinking is in corporations uh, i mean i think it's the, the the number of cases where companies once they get big stop being innovative and yeah. really struggle to to be innovative again um you know kodak is blown away by the next form of photography but an even more instructive example is nokia nokia you know which is a um the dominant firm in the mobile phone market globally yeah. and you know there are headlines like who can stop nokia yeah. um uh, and uh, it's an extraordinary success story but by then it's so big that it starts to take a very long time to take decisions it starts to get too uh, invested in its own products and it doesn't like disrupting its own business model so for example it doesn't embrace data it sticks with voice uh, and so on um and eventually nokia fades from sight and shrinks dramatically so um uh yes there is a problem with bigness and you know i don't see a problem with smallness either in companies or in countries you know yes. some people say oh well, you don't want to just sing be singapore why not singapore's yeah. extremely successful hong kong incredibly successful um you know there are mauritius is a successful economy you know that you do not have to this this weird idea that you have to be a big country to be successful is just disproven again and again um uh, you know think of venice or genoa you know dominating the mediterranean for centuries Absolutely and we have time for one last uh, question from the audience and this is Rohan Bajaj who asks do you think covid-19 pandemic could present us with an innovation moment like for all of us uh, I'm yes i think you're the answer on this because you know on the one hand you need you know cities and people mingling you know one of your old themes which is ideas yes. having sex and things like that <laughs> but on the other hand we're in this moment of crisis where everyone's trying to come together and find solutions so you know which one of those tendencies will will win i'm i'm, I'm very curious like rohan about about this yeah well uh, like you and rohan i don't know the answer i don't know which way it's going to go but and i'm worried about one and excited about the other clearly you know video conferencing has come of age this year just to give an example it's nothing to do with medicine um yeah. uh, and it's not because the technology has has advanced dramatically but because there's suddenly a huge demand because of the 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 the, the, the virus and it, it it's reached critical mass in a way that email reached critical mass in the early 1990s and you know suddenly we you, you could assume that your friends had email so you asked for their email and so it suddenly became a new way of cor of corresponding with people uh, likewise i think video conferencing has now uh, achieved that um and that's good and as you and there are lots of other things like you know changing the patterns of commuting and and other things that are going to come out of this as well as all the medical stuff i mean i think we're going to transform diagnosis as well as vaccination but like you i worry that we've spent a whole year not bumping into each other in over the water cooler or in the pub um 
and having that conversation that could lead to that idea that could lead to that business. And it isn't the same. You, know, you and I will know this on, on a screen, uh, having a chat and a drink. It, it sort of works for a bit, but it, you can't interrupt each other. You can't sort of brainstorm in the same way. Um, so we do need to get back to the human way of interacting as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for this, Matt. This was such a pleasure for everyone else. The book is called How Innovation Works. It's just, uh, you know, such a fantastic look into what it takes to make innovation work, not just in terms of individuals or governments or our usual creationist thinking, but just thinking about broader themes about the extended order, how to create a society where great ideas can flourish time and again, even when we don't know what those great ideas may be. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Sanjoy. Can I just say, Shruti, thank you very much. And can, I, can we have a drink next time if we're allowed to? Absolutely. That would be a pleasure. Maybe in Jaipur. Definitely. <laughs> Matt Ridley, Shruti Rajagopalan, thank you so much for this brilliant conversation. I wish it didn't end. Um, the problem with Zoom is that it doesn't allow you for that accidental meeting, which yeah. is ever so important uh, to be able to take forward, as you said, uh, innovations, not necessarily by just geniuses, but the average joke on the street. So we do need to get back to those drinks in the pubs, etc. at some point of time. Uh, Shruti, uh, just for your information, the princesses, uh, the, the vaccination that they did was in 1805. And oh. I'm going to ask Rajat to just share the photograph so that Matt can see it. Rajat, can you share oh, the photograph? That would be fantastic for all fantastic. the audience. Interesting thing was... Rajat? I'll screen share it. Okay. And the it, the interesting thing is that, can you see? So this yeah. is the oh, that's wonderful. princesses. And the amazing thing is it was their grand aunt, meaning the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sort of grand queen, meaning much older than them, who said of them, you must popularize the use of vaccination and inoculation. That's and wonderful. Then, Therefore, in 1805, this very famous photograph that I just shared with you uh, came into being uh, to be able to show why, I mean, you know, really to look at the fact that if they could do it, everybody else could. So, you know, amazing. I, I wish today that there were enough people in key posts in government or key influencers sort of wearing their mask appropriately, uh, collectively, and that perhaps would have been one way uh, to get well, uh, but I think with vaccination, that opportunity is still before us. In other words, um, the president or the prime minister of a country uh, showing himself being vaccinated in the weeks ahead is probably going to happen. I hope so. And I hope they don't start pushing back. There's so many conspiracy theories, as we know, even on COVID. But thank you, Shruti Rajakupalan. Thank you, Matt Ridley. That was an absolutely brilliant session. Uh, very, very interesting. I hope you all have enjoyed it. We're sorry we weren't able to take all your questions. We do encourage you to buy the books of our speakers, and these are available through Brazos a Bookstore in Houston and Full Circle in India. Uh, once again, thank you to all our advisors, donors, and partners for their support. A special thanks to all our advisors, and I hope you will tune in to our next session. Winners take it all. Anand Girdhari Das in conversation with Kanish Tharoor, and that's at 10.15 a.m. Central Standard Time, 8.15 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9.15 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, and 11.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, 9.45 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading from our Jaipur Writer Short Series, which has been so popular. Please do send us your recordings and your work, anything that you've written, that you want to record and send it in to us, please do so. This is a series that we will continue through the year. Uh, please join me in listening to Anna Heyman RF from the Jaipur Writers Short Series. <laughs> Vacancies by Anna Heyman RF. Wellbeing counselors, worldwide positions, financial grief. Counselors, teacher of English, lost languages, drug and alcohol rehabilitation officer, lost generation pay grade. 
political doublespeak, case manager, family violence crisis workers, edge of reason roles. Customer service officer, aged and carer services, forgotten division. Men's family violence, sanity project officers. Family services locum, dislocation expertise required. Celebrity manager, sycophant roles. Youth in crisis worker, lost generation pay grade. We are burning, technical assurance manager. Can't breathe, active agent. Bigotry service officer, prejudice band. Pussy consultant, males only. Democracy manager, no experience required. Lost votes, enablers, erasure officers, Terra Nullius sector, conspiracy theory, business analyst, rising sea levels, expression of interest, regulatory roles, pollution project officer, ongoing role, global surveillance, compliance officers, the future, CEO, end of days expert. <laughs> I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue, of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. much about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics, it's meaningful, I'm just excited, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Work 
Arts, bringing India to the world and the world to India through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars. Be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, Festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzy. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the Multi-City Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts, celebrating the arts. For more information, visit www.teamworkarts.com